Welcome to Aircrew Interview, I'm Mike from your host, and in this episode we chat to former F-16C pilot Carl Gruner. In part two of Carl's interview, he talks about how he got selected to fly the F-16, the aircraft's strengths and weaknesses, how it handled, getting posted to Germany, DACT, and much more. So if you like what we do here and enjoy our content and would like to see more, you can do this by donating monthly at patreon.com forward slash aircrew interview. Thank you and enjoy. We're going to talk about now about your time on the F-16. You always wanted a fighter, as you as you mentioned. So how did you get selected to fly the F-16? Well, I had heard that, you know, okay, I love the 111, but there were a couple of things that I wanted to do is, first of all, do some air-to-air, -air, no real air-to-air. -air. <laughs> and, of course, my first choice out of pilot training, I told you, was the F-15. But then I thought, well, maybe the F-16 would be a better transition because it's multi-role, right? So it still does some bombing, and I already enjoyed that part in the F-111. So I thought maybe the F-16 would be a better fit for me. But so one way to go to the F-16 was to volunteer for what was called a bad deal assignment. And that was to be an air liaison officer with the Army on the ground for 18 months, for, for a year and a half. And this was in Germany. So I volunteered to do that wow. with the understanding that when I finished that assignment, I would get my choice of aircraft. And actually, honestly, there wasn't a hundred percent guarantee, but they, you know, the experience was typically they did come through and give you, give you your choice of aircraft yeah. and it worked out for me. So I spent, actually I ended up being 20 months in Germany as a ground you know, air liaison officer with the 3rd Infantry Division in Aschaffenburg, Germany. Uh, some people hated that kind of job. Actually, I enjoyed it quite a bit, actually. Um, it was my first time commanding uh, Air Force enlisted airmen. So, you know, I was the commander of a tactical air control party, uh, which was, of course, in charge of liaising with the Army and controlling close air support and support of the Army. And. And actually, uh, you know, I had a pretty good time. Other than the fact I wasn't flying, uh, I, I thought it was a pretty cool job. You know, I got to play with some of the Army toys like the M1 tank and the M2 Bradley. And, you know, they, the Army was more than happy to let me, you know, drive them, shoot them, uh, you know, stuff like that. So, so that was enjoyable. But then, so at the conclusion of that, I put in my first choice, you know, F-16, and I wanted to stay in Germany. So I said, uh, Han Air Base, number one, and I got my first choice of both. I got an F-16 at Han Air Base. So... Uh, in Germany, and so I was very happy with that. Of course, the first thing I had to go to training in at Luke Air Force Base in Arizona, you know, to to transition to the F-16. Um, and uh, before that, I had to go to the centrifuge. Now, when I went to the 111, uh, in, back in those days, the, uh, regardless of what fighter, even for the F-15 or F-16, the a centrifuge ride was not required. However, after a couple of accidents of, you know, G loss of, G induced loss of consciousness and, and pilots dying, you know, impacting the ground uh, because they lost consciousness due to high Gs, the Air Force decided it was wise to give us extra training in the, you know, in, in the G maneuvers. And so before I had to go to Luke, I had to go to the centrifuge, which I did in Texas at Brooks Air Force Base. And uh, after that, I reported to Luke Air Force Base and went through four months of F-16 training. Now, the, the full F-16 training is six months, but since I came already from a fighter plane, it was four months. And uh, that was very exciting. That was fantastic. I just just loved it. And, you know, it was exactly what I wanted. It's exactly what I wanted. Yeah, and how did you find that transition going from, you know, the F-111 just through training and then you're on this electric jet? How was that for you? <laughs> yeah, the F-16 is just an incredible aircraft. Now, Amazingly enough, it was interesting because in the academics, the, the, from the system's point of view, like the electrical system, the fuel system, the hydraulic system, even the flight controls to some extent. And of course, the F-16 was the first fighter with a fully electric, you know, electronic electric flight control system, you know, computer control. Uh, uh, but but you could you could see that the, both aircraft had been designed by the by the same company. It was General Dynamics at, at the time. Of course, now later on, you know, they were bought by Lockheed. And, uh, but, you know, they were both GD aircraft, and you could tell that some of the design philosophies were very similar, mm -hmm. even though the aircraft were very, very different. <laughs> uh, but that was, was kind of interesting. 
And uh, of course, yeah, it was, uh, you know, one of the things that was very different was the side stick, you know, yeah. but that, it took like one flight to get used to it. Okay. You know, of course you got some simulator flights ahead of time. Um, so to me, it was very natural. In fact, now I'm the point that like, uh, I, I don't understand why anybody would design an aircraft without the side stick. But, and of course, you know, the F-35, the F-22, the Rafale in France has, but they all have side sticks. And even the airline industry adopted that, like some of the Air, you know, Airbus, they have side sticks. And yeah, it seems like a logical regression, doesn't it, from a yes. side stick? Yeah. Now, you know, one of the objections as well. If you get shot in the incapacitated in your right arm, then it's hard to fly, yeah. you know. Right. Yeah. That's very rare. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, it's like what did that when's the last time that happened? So I I think I'll think I'll take the compromise. Yeah. Can you describe your first flight and having that power in that afterburn? And that must have been yeah. a big kick in the pants. So of course the first flight is with an instructor in the back seat in the two seater. But it wasn't a clean airplane, so you know, no external tanks. Or maybe there was a sun line, but it, it, regard, regardless, uh, it was, you know, we didn't have a heavy load. And yeah, it was it was a uh, full afterburner. Uh, now, when you were in a clean airplane, you, you didn't have to use full afterburner. But Luke Air Force Base gets pretty hot. And every time the temperature was above 100 degrees Fahrenheit ambient, they, they made you use the afterburner regardless. So so it was full afterburner. Yeah, it, it was it was amazing. You know, it was eye watering. Now, these, these were aircraft of the Pratt & Whitney dash no f100 dash 200 air uh, uh, engine so um and even you know with a high ambient temperature it does reduce the power some but even then it was amazing it's just you know it's just incredible it, everything happens very fast um, but again you, you know you get some practice in the simulator so it wasn't like entirely surprising but doing it in the actual airplane is in that bubble canopy was just fantastic Absolutely. Now, you know, we didn't do a max performance climb. We came out of afterburner at 300 knots or so. And so, you know, to conserve fuel and, you know, we went to a, an area to do some basic handling, you know, getting used to handling the aircraft, doing some loops and rolls and various maneuvers to just get used to handling the aircraft. Simulator does a pretty good job, but, you know, it's not exactly all right. So a few you know it's much better to feel the actual aircraft and then you'd come back and do some instrument approaches and things because uh you know, your first check ride before you go into you know the actual tactical things is to do an instrument check ride so you are qualified to fly the airplane so, mm -hmm. so a lot of uh, ILS uh, you know precision approaches and things things like that and visual approaches and, and whatnot uh, I think he, at, at the time, I think we got three rides in the two seater. Now, they, you know, the, the, the students coming straight out of pilot training would get more than that. And they have a six month course, I think six and a half months, actually. I went through the four month course the first time. Later on, after I did a staff tour, I went back to the F 16 and went through a two month course because I was coming from F 16 back to F 16. So it was a very fast course. But this one, the four months, <clears throat> because I came from another fighter plane, <clears throat> I think we got three rides. Uh, and then we went solo, you know, uh, of course you had, you did have a, you know, an instructor chase, you know, in another mm -hmm. single seat. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was, you know, that was cool. And, uh, then so I think we got a, we got in one air refueling flight, uh, and then we got into the tactical phase, you know, we're starting with air to air and then moving to air to ground. So, mm -hmm. you know, BFM first, DACT second, and then air to ground rides. Mm -hmm. So was the F-16 at this time when you were joining split 50-50 uh, air to ground, you know, and then air to air? In theory, there were units that were, uh, depending on, the, on which unit you were assigned to. You know, and, and the one I went to in a, at Han eventually was definitely more air to ground. But uh, the, we did have an air to air role. And, you know, the, we had NATO exercises, uh, which we can talk later. But just to mention, typically in those NATO exercises, they would last a whole week from Monday morning to Friday afternoon. Hmm. Uh, they were called salty nation exercises and in those in the f-16 the first two days were air to air so we would do air defense alert we would sit alert you know on an intercept uh as a backup to the f-15s from bitburg mostly uh, and we would uh, like the f-15s would take the higher altitudes would be uh, the lower altitudes doing orbits and you know bouncing aircraft left and right <laughs> uh, and then the then the next couple of days were conventional air to ground 
Um, mostly main mission was battlefield air interdiction and air interdiction. Uh, not a lot of CAS. Occasionally we do a close air support, but that was not nearly the main mission. I mean, the A-10s were there for that. So, yeah. um, and then the last day, day and a half were the nuclear mission. So, you know, the, there was uh, F-16s who were nuclear capable. Uh, and my, in fact, my first operational check ride at Han was a nuclear profile. So that's something that people don't think about. But of course, that was a big thing in the F-111 as well. And the big difference, it was the same bombs, you know, B-61s, but uh, F-111, we carried two, and the F-16, we only carried one. It could, in theory, carry more, but mm -hmm. one is the, the load. So, so uh, in your opinion, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the F-16? Well, obviously, the strengths is the maneuverability um, uh, is is absolutely awesome. Now, of course, you know, now compared to the newer airplanes like the Rafale, the Eurofighter, it's gonna be a little bit behind, but I don't even think that it's, the difference is that great. I mean, it depends who you talk to. I mean, there are, you, you've interviewed pilots that have flown both, so I know I've never flown the Eurofighter. I've never even fought against the Eurofighter or Rafale, because I, I stopped flying before those came in, in line. You know, I fought, I fought plenty of other airplanes like F-18s, F-14s, F F-15s a lot. And other F 16s from other nations, but uh, and Mirage 2000 as well. But uh, the newer generations, of course, are very, very good. So, but at the time, for sure, it was like the king of dogfight, you know. I mean, but again, you know, I guess an F 15 or an F 18, the pilot could make a difference. It's mm -hmm. not like it was an automatic win, but let's just say it was very good. Um, and it actually had pretty good range. And a lot of people knock the F-16 for being short range. It's actually not true. It's, uh, and, uh, you know, compared to the F-4, for sure, it has much better range. And, and the proof was, I know guys, no, I never flew at Spangdalem, uh, but for a while they had the F-4Gs, you know, Wild Weasel flying at Spangdalem, yeah. and they had F-16Cs carrying the harm missiles and they would fly missions together right so the the f4g was in the lead and the f16 would be the you know the the, the harm carrier and escort like if they were bounced and the f16 would take care of the air to air threats and invariably the f16 would outrange the f4 easily on the same okay. yeah it's not even close i mean well not even great again if the f4 carried three tanks you know and the f16 only two tanks Maybe it was a little closer, but, and it certainly has more range than the F-18. In, in similar configuration, no, easily, F-16 is more range than the F-18. Not the Super Hornet, mind you, mm -hmm. but the, the, the legacy Hornets. So, um, so, yeah, of course, people compare it to the F-15E. Yes, of course, compared to that, you know, it's not going to be in the same class. So, uh, you know, and of course, you know, it, it is a bit more limited than to carrying capability. And again, if you compare it to an F-15E, yes, it's going to fall way short uh, in that in that respect. But overall, for what it's designed to do, is it is it really good. So uh, weaknesses. Uh, well, you know, I, when I first started flying the uh, the F-16, we didn't have AMRAM yet. So I guess you could consider that at the time was a weakness, but of course, as we all know, that was quickly rectified. And by the time I flew the F-16 at Kunsan in, in 1994 in, in Korea, we had AMRAM. Um, so that made a big difference. Uh, the, the radar was pretty good, obviously not as good as an f 15 radar at the time. Now, of course, in the world of electronically scanned radars, you know, on, the world has changed, but for the time, it's actually, it was pretty good. Um, you know, it's it was definitely capable. You know, I don't, I didn't think it had uh, that much of a weakness. Like people will say, uh, will say two things that it it was single engine, therefore that's weak. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, you know, there are plenty of other single engine aircraft everywhere, and historically. Most fighters are single engine. You know, some people didn't even traditionally consider, you know. If, like even in World War II, most fighters, you know, there was a P-38 and, you know, some others, but single engine is kind of like the norm, you know. I mean, it, uh, even in the Navy, now they say, oh, you know, single engine F-35C is bad, but the F-8, the A-7, yeah. I mean, it is like a plethora of, of a single engine aircraft in the past. And then now the reliability of engines is way higher than they used oh, to be yeah. back then. 
And somehow people weren't really complaining about it too much. But okay, everything being equal, having two engines is better. Uh, so, but you could say being single engine is a weakness, but I didn't consider it a weakness. And honestly, I never had, I never lost an engine in the F16 ever. Mm -hmm. uh, not it has happened, you know. So there are cases where people either had to eject or had to glide, and that's something we practice quite often: is uh, sing, you know, simulated flame out patterns, simulating that your engine's flamed out. Of course, we wouldn't actually shut off the engine in in, you know, in, in normal flight. That would be pretty dangerous. <laughs> but you would bring it back all the way to idle and glide. And the glide ratio was 2.5 nautical miles per thousand foot of altitude that you had. Um, okay. So. Uh, so you could glide, like I remember at Injerlik uh, in, in Turkey, practicing stuff when you, you would start like at 40,000 feet and and then bring the engine back to idle and you could glide like, uh, you know, over 70 miles to, <laughs> to in, back to Injerlik. And it was kind of boring because you were going like 170 knots, I think was best glide airspeed. Uh, so <laughs> it would take forever, but you would practice all the way. Now you weren't allowed to actually touch down from the from this glide, but you you know you could do a little approach, very low, and and prove that the airplane, you know, if you had a problem in the you know while doing a dock fight or something, the engine flamed out, you could actually recover to the base while gliding. So that was feasible. Now you probably would have to jettison any you know external tanks that you had or something like. That. Have less drag, um, but again, that was something we, you know, we would practice in a simulator. <laughs> <laughs> Jettison actual ordnance. Uh, I mean, I've dropped actual bombs and uh, things um, from the F-16s, you know, including live live ordnance. But um, I never shot a missile though, which was kind of disappointing. Uh, <laughs> but that's not something that most people end up doing in their career. With me. If you're lucky, you get to shoot one. But... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, so you kind of you do, you got through your training now, and you're going to head over to Germany. Can you tell us about what it was like flying the F-16 in Germany? And yeah, maybe talk a bit a bit more about that nuke roll because that sounds interesting. Well, you know, by the time I got to the F-16, we no longer pulled permanent alert. Now, when I was in the F-111 at Lake Anise, we did. You know, every about six weeks or so, I uh, would pull one week of alert. So you were restricted to this compound. Now you could go a little bit on base. There was there was like an area where you had an actually dedicated uh, vehicle that you could drive, but you you know if a klaxon sounded, the klaxon sounded, you had to go back to your aircraft, start engines, and then be ready to receive a message that mm -hmm. told you you know what your target and, and things like that. So so we practiced that, and we were on alert for one week at a time at Lake Anise. Now by the time I got to the F-16, we still had the new role. As I mentioned, but we no longer pulled permanent alert. Now, and okay, occasionally for exercise purposes, we would generate the alert and put aircraft online um, and be ready to go. But that was just for practice, right? Just in case. So, because remember, this is the late '80s. So even though it was still the Cold War, under Gorbachev, the Soviet Union had kind of relaxed a little bit. You know, there was perestroika and Glasnost and all these things and. So things had relaxed somewhat, and we weren't quite, you know, yeah. quite as ready uh, or you know, quite poised as we were earlier on. And so, uh, even though we could regenerate the nuclear alert mission, it was not something that we did on a regular basis mm -hmm. anymore. Um, so that was uh, it. Was interesting. The, the you know the profiles were relatively simple compared to an air-to-air -air mission or a conventional air-to-ground. However. The thing is, you you were not allowed any mistakes. So, you know, if you, if you made a mistake, you 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 failed the ride. You know, basically. So yeah, of course. It was like uh, no room for error. You know, yeah, and you went in front of a certification board, where a group of like ten people, experts in their fields, mm -hmm. and you're standing in front of them, including maybe not the wing commander, but like you know, a, a full bird colonel, like the the ops officer, the mm -hmm. the ops commander for the base, or deputy commander or some, somebody like that and it's pretty impressive and you know first you brief your your mission and uh, then they ask you a bunch of questions you know what would you do if this happened you, you lose your generator you, you know whatever I mean. and uh, you better have the right answers so you absolutely. study very very hard for these these certification boards it was yeah. 
it was pretty intense. So, and it's the same with 111 was the same way, but the 111, you had the advantage, you had your crew member, your whistle. So you were, you certified as a team. You, you, so maybe you didn't know the answer, but your whistle <laughs> could answer or vice versa. Yeah. In the I-16, it was you. That's it. You were by yourself. So you, you and had to I'm, have the Yeah. And I want to talk about DACT because it is certainly one of our favorite yeah, topics. Everybody loves uh, that. Yeah, they love it. And you mentioned you flew against everything. So, and obviously you're in Europe at this point. So you have all the best 80s and, you know, 70s jets there. So can you, uh, you know, tell us how the F-16 fared against the likes of, uh, I don't know, tornadoes, uh, mirages, etc. cetera, um, of that time? Well, I'll, let's, go, let, let's separate two things. So while flying low altitude air to ground missions, you know, over Germany or other parts of Europe, you would get bound, you would cross paths with, I mean, untold number of aircraft back in the Cold War. I mean, you know, everything. You just mentioned quite a few, but that's not real DACT. In other words, you, you were able to engage them, but you were limited to 180 degree turns and then you were not supposed to, to yeah. keep dock fighting because first of all, you were at low altitude. So, you know, it, it was a lot more dangerous for one thing. And so, you know, some of the allies, particularly the Canadians, they, they didn't really care. You know, they, they would do whatever, but we, we, we did abide by those rules. So we, we do a reaction turn, uh, and then, you know, rock the wings meaning, Hey, that's enough. You know, we, 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 we reacted, we saw you, uh, yeah, tons of airplanes. And then there was the, the, the real, you know, planned DACT missions, which tend of course happened at higher altitudes in the, in training areas, uh, typically above 10,000 feet. Uh, and those, uh, happen, you know, Say you know on a fairly regular basis. Uh, again, in the F-16 at Han, we were more oriented to air to ground. So I would say only about 40% of the missions were air to air, and that included some that were just straight BFM, so you know one v one, and mostly against other F-16s. Uh, but okay, occasionally against another aircraft, so DBFM, dissimilar BFM. I remember my first dissimilar BFM actually was what back at Luke when I was in the training squadron. One of my very first BFM flights was against an F-18. Mm -hmm. you know, so that was very interesting. And actually, I did quite well against it. So even though I only had like 15 hours in the aircraft <laughs> in the F-16, this guy was a you know a thousand hour F-18 guy. Um, now, granted, these were you know pretty. This, we never in, in that flight. Um, I was doing. Uh, offensive BFM. So I started with an advantage. So obviously, you know, that's, that's a big caveat. Yeah. But I mean, you know, of course, he was trying everything to do to reverse the roles and everything like that. And I, you know, I, I did quite well, the F-16 was very now, at low speeds, though, you know, if you, if you slow down too much, the F-18 was better. So there's oh, no yeah. doubt about it. And I'm saying, you know, many of your previous interviews, I think pointed that out. But uh, well, going back to weak points, I guess you could say that, that at the very low speed maneuvering, the F-16 was definitely not the best. Mm -hmm. okay? If you got below 150 knots, even 200 knots, that's not where you want to fight the F-16. And the reason is because the computer control system, the flight control system, would limit your angle of attack and limit what you can do. It did that for your own good in a way to prevent the airplane from going into a spin, you know, inadvertently. And it was great at doing that. Um, but on the other hand, the negative part of that is you did not have the nose, nose pointing authority that can even an F-15, certainly an F-18 or Mirage 2000 at low speed had way more nose, po nose pointing authority compared to an F-16. So in the F-16, you want to keep faster. You want to keep above 300 knots, for sure above 250. And you're going to try to fight the rate turn. So mm -hmm. the F-16 at that time, you know, again, now with the newer generations of fighters, certainly the F-22 is better, but the, uh, you know, that's a different story. But uh, at that time was the best sustained turn rate fighter anywhere. Okay. Um, nobody could beat it in a sustained turn rate fight, as opposed to an instantaneous turn rate, which mm -hmm. again, some fighters were a little bit better. Um, so what you wanted to do is two circle kind of fights and you wanted to try to outrate the other fighter, uh, in a sustained turn rate fight. Mm -hmm. Now that, the, the thing with that is you put a lot of G's for a long time. That airplane of course was nine G capable, but it could sustain, uh, maybe not nine G's at a higher altitude, but you could sustain a lot of G's for a long time. And it yeah. was very tiring after a while. So, um, 
you know, but uh, so I guess you could add that to the list of weaknesses, I guess, of the F-16s. Low speed maneuverability was not the best. Yeah, we have fought, I fought uh, one of my memorable deployments in the F-16 from Han was to Israel. At the time, this was a very highly classified deployment. We couldn't talk about it. Of course, now it's, you know, you can open a magazine like Air Combat, you know, Combat Aircraft or something, read about deployments to Israel and Israelis deploying to Greece. And, you know, it's all out in the open now. But at the time, it was pretty highly classified. And uh, there, we actually, amazingly enough, at the time, we did not get to fight against Israelis. Um, we, got, we got to interact with them on the ground a lot and talk to to some of their legendary pilots like Menachem Shmuel, who you know was a Mirage Three pilot in the '67 war, and told us some incredible war stories. And he ended up being one of the test pilots for the Lavi. But what what we did, as far as going back to the ACT, what we did do, the, the uh, I think it was the Carl Vinson aircraft carrier was off the coast of Israel in the Med, mm -hmm. and we did get to fight against F-14s and F-18s from the carrier, uh, and we had Israeli controllers, you know, the, the ground GCI vectoring us against them. And that was very interesting. So, uh, you know, good to fight against F-14s and F-18s. I guess the F-18s, it was kind of, they were at a disadvantage because they were carrying three, you know, three tanks. And so obviously their maneuverability was restricted because of that. Uh, so it's not fair to say, yeah, uh, we did really good against the F-18s in the dock fight, in the DSUTs there, because we did, but Again, we were carrying only centerline tanks and they were carrying three tanks. So yeah, it's obviously they're gonna be at a disadvantage. Now for the F-14s, they were, you know, in the standard configuration. And uh, these were A models though. So, you know, they had the TF-30 engines, so they not quite the power that you would like. Uh, I never fought against the B or D model. Uh, so I can't speak to that, but of course I know they were quite a bit, you know, had a lot more power. Mm -hmm. uh, but we did quite well against the F-14, you know, in a, in a visual fight. Mm -hmm. um, the other aircraft that I fought the mo most against in DACT is the F-15, you know, US F-15s. Uh, most because at Han, Bitburg was, you know, right down the street, so yeah. to speak. And we flew against the F-15s at Bitburg quite a lot. Uh, now, when I did that, this was pre-AMRAM days. But we did still did quite well. You know, I'm not going to say, ah, oh, the F-16 won all the time. And that's not true. The F-15 guys were very good. For one thing, that's all they did, whereas air-to-air. -air. So, uh, whereas we only did, like, say, about 40% air-to-air, if that, you know, between 30 and 40%. But I'll tell you, you know, of course, they had the AIM-7 at the time. They still didn't have m either, but at least they had the AIM-7, you know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are ways to... The maneuver to turn either defeat or make it very hard for them to employ these. But once you got into a visual fight, the F-16 was more maneuverable, uh, but that wasn't the biggest difference uh, because, okay, good pilots could make up for the, for the difference there. I'll tell you what the biggest difference is, is the size of the aircraft. Mm -hmm. They would constantly lose sight of us, whereas we, you know, they were so much bigger it, it, for us, it was pretty easy for us to spot them. And, you know, there's this saying in, in the ACT is lose sight, lose fight. I mean, that's true. Yeah. And uh, if you lose sight of the other guy, particularly in the F-16 pointing at you like this, it's really hard to see. I mean, I had that problem, you know, fighting other F-16s and, and even within my own flight, keeping track of my wingman or, you know, or me as a wingman keeping track of my lead. Sometimes it was very hard because it's just a small airplane, you know. It's not as small as an F-5, but it's it's pretty small. You know? yes. And made it gray like this. The, the gray paint was very effective. Uh, so uh, it depended on, you know, on the sun angles and the, on the background, but uh, overall very effective. And so once you get into a turning fight, uh, because of the, the the difference in size, uh, if it was a particular multi-bogey environment, you know, like 4v4, uh, we were quite successful. And I would say the biggest difference was not maneuverability or pilot skill. It was it was the fact that they would lose sight of us way more often than we would have done. That sounds like you went up against some great aircraft. But uh, yeah, how uh, long did you spend in Germany? Three years, a little, just a little less than three years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that was, that was uh, say again, a fantastic time. Uh, now, I was there at the transition, you know, in 1990. <laughs> it was a sad day. I think it was 
the 30th of September. So the 1st of October, if I remember well, maybe it was one September. Like, anyway, in that time frame of 1990, the, you know, the Cold War had ended, you know, re Germany reuni reunifying. And they changed the low flying rules. Like we, you know, before that we could fly at 500 feet everywhere over Germany and 250 feet in certain designated low fly area, like low fly seven in Bavaria and things like that. And on that day, I think maybe it was the beginning of September, everything went to a thousand feet, which for me was not low altitude anymore. It's just like, yeah. nah, it's just bad. You know, it, it was just ridiculous. But, uh, you know, it was a new era and, uh, you know, people didn't like the noise, you know, jet noise, the sound of freedom. But now they were like, well, there's no enemy anymore. So why do we have to put up with this noise? And, and so we went to a thousand feet. But then again, you know, I only did that for about, what, three months. And then I, I left the base anyway to do uh, my next assignment. So most of the time I was there, you know, we were still flying low altitude, very exciting, engaging a bunch of airplanes everywhere. Uh, crazy Canadians, you know, I'm flying at 250 feet in low fly seven. And even though they're not supposed to be lower than that, the uh, Canadian F-18s are like at a hundred feet, you know, I mean, they, they are just, and they, they would not give up. I mean, they would engage, you know, we'd, we'd do the 180 rock the wing, but they, they would, they wanted to fight. I mean, just. And, uh, you know, we didn't want to get in trouble, so we kind of abided by the rules. Um, <laughs> yeah, sensible so, move. But... Yeah, one of the, you know, a, a really neat exercise was, I think, it was a French exercise where basically the French Air Force was tasked to defense, the defense of French airspace. And we were, we were the intruders, right, trying to ingress into France. And they had Mirage 2000s and Mirage F1s trying to intercept us. And, of course, we'd ingress at low altitude, make it hard for them. And that was very exciting too, because even though it wasn't DACT, we still engaged, you know, into you know, trying to sneak and, and try to shoot them down and, uh, and vice versa. And, uh, you know, again, uh, at low altitude, we were pretty successful because at the time, if I remember well, most of their Mirage 2000, maybe all of them at the time, that was before the, the 2000-5 came in service. So the Mirage 2000's radar was not all that good at low altitude. I mean, it was it was somewhat limited, and so a lot of the time they had to rely. And then G, their GCI, you know, if we were at 250 feet or even 500 feet, they had a hard time seeing us because of the terrain. Now they had AWACS, so you know, yeah, they, they, that helped them a lot uh, to try to vector us towards them. But it, you know, it was it was pretty exciting. This yeah, time. it sounds like you had a great time there. But uh, uh, so it was good. So I, I fought against the ACT against F-15, F-18, Mirage 2000, uh, uh, F-14. Uh, never, I think that's it. I think I don't remember. Tornadoes? Vector to, oh. Tornado F-3, no, I never, you know, never, never engaged one of those. Uh, against a regular Tornado, Tornado GR-1 or GR-4, it would be no contest anyway, and then if you know, it, it wouldn't even be uh, a challenge. But uh, yeah. against the F3, I never fought. But my understanding, and you, you've had plenty of interviews. And uh, uh, I remember that one where the the interviewee—I I can't remember his name—but a, a former Tornado F3 said, "Okay, well, F16 went against me and went one circle, hmm. uh, as an F16 would do." And my, I think I come out and. No, not only in F-16, we would, we would go two circle in a DACT because, again, we were, we were a rate fighter. However, because the F-3 did not have a very good turn radius, yes, again, specifically against an F-3, we might go one circle because that yeah. would be the skill. But that's that would be more the exception than the rule. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that would be just specifically against the type of aircraft. So how many hours did you get um, on the F-16? I got about 650 hours because I, I had one more. I only had one more tour. I had the three years at home and then I had a one year tour at Kunsan later. So I went for a while. I went to Desert Storm, you know, at the end of 1990. So 1991 is when Desert Shield, Desert Storm happened. And I, then the Air Force ended up sending me back to that war as a ground fact forward air controller slash air liaison officer. And so I did the war in Saudi Arabia and Iraq in Kuwait on the ground with an armored division, an army division, because of my previous experience as an ALO, and they needed ALOs. Um, so that was kind of unfortunate because I would have loved to fly there. And one of the squadrons from Han, the 10th fighter squadron, my squadron was a 313th, uh, Lucky Puppies, and 
they did not end up going to the war anyway. Um, so they stayed back home. But the 10th Fighter Squadron, Sabres, did deploy uh, to Saudi Arabia. Well, actually, they were in Qatar, I want to say. I can't remember exactly. Anyway, but flew in Kuwait. And, um, and so that was kind of missed my chance to actually fly in a real war, you know. Uh, that was did you enjoy sad. that fuck role being on the ground? Yeah, no, it was. It was, uh, you know, I did control a bunch of A-10s in actual combat missions where we, you know, dropped bombs and shot missiles and fired the gun against uh, Iraqi ground troops. Um, now, thankfully, that fight was not too hard because, you know, as you well know, the 100-hour ground war was very much one-sided. Uh, I was in the 3rd Armored Division and um, in the 3rd Brigade specifically. And so there was only one full 24-hour period where there was no kidding on the front line. Because the 3rd Brigade or the 3rd Armor, for sure, the 3rd Armor was only engaged for a couple of days, you know, no kidding uh, against actual Iraqi units. And then initially my brigade was the Reserve Brigade, but then on the last day we went up and we were the you know, Exploitation Brigade where uh, we were in the front. So that's when, that's the last day, the last full day of the war, I actually controlled a lot of aircraft, almost control an AC-130 at night, Whoa. but they were, it was handed up over to me and I talked to them. Problem is I had no target for them at the time because mm. the army was very efficient at destroying the targets right away. You know, they were, the M1s were very effective and their artillery was very effective. And basically, it was kind of, you know, disappointing because I'm like, right now, the army doesn't have a target for you. So, uh, you know, go find some other place where you can be useful. Because, <laughs> so, so I talked to the AC-130, but I did not employ it. So that would have been exciting. Definitely, but I uh, yeah. did control several flights of A-10s and I think one flight of F-16s in the casserole. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, again, it was uh, relatively... You know, well, I wouldn't say easy. It's, it's actual war. People are shooting and dying, you know, so it's not easy. But, you know, when you compare that to some of the, the, the much harder fights like in Afghanistan and Iraq later, uh, it, you know, I, I, I felt like I had it relatively easy. Mm -hmm. And I think after this, after this role, didn't you go on to fly the GE F-16s? Yes. So... So then I had a brief staff tour at Rammstein, you know, being on the staff, being a planner for basing, you know, uh, one of the things I worked on is the rebasing of F-16 from Torrejon Air Base in Spain, where they were going to, you know, they said, okay, well, they, we don't want them there anymore. And they ended up being at Aldiano. So I worked on that project. But then I was selected to go back to fly the F-16 in Korea. So I went back to Luke, as mentioned, for two months to get retrained. I had to go back to the centrifuge because if it was more than three years since the last flight in the F-16, you had to go back to the centrifuge. But that time, instead of going to the centrifuge in the United States, I went to the one in the Netherlands. Uh, and so, uh, so it was a little different, but it's not the same basic principle. Mm -hmm. So I went, uh, I went there, did the centrifuge, then, then two months at Luke, and then I spent a year uh, at Kunsan Air Base in the Republic of Korea, you know, South Korea. And that, yes, indeed, that was, these were Block 30 uh, F-16s. The ones at Han were Block 25, by the way, if anybody you know, wonders. We were, at Han, by the time I left, we were scheduled to trans transition to the Block 40. And we actually received a couple of jets before I left. But they quickly, because of the end of the Cold War, they canceled that transition. And eventually, you know, just a couple of years later, they closed the, the wing at Han. So, right. and you know, you well know, Han eventually became the Ryanair hub in <laughs> Germany, you know, like a, a civilian airfield. So, yeah. Um, so anyway, but to go back to this, yes, the, so the Black 30 at Kunsan had the GE engine, and that was a significant difference in thrust. You, you could tell. I mean, they, no kidding. It had the, these were big mouth, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the small mouth versus big mouth F-16s, the GE engine. The very, very early GE engine powered F-16s still had the small mouth. And it's an interesting story because at Rammstein, when they transitioned from the F-4 to the F-16, they had a mixture of... Uh, 
GE engine with small mouth and GE engine with big mouth. And I've been told, and I've never been in that situation myself, but I've been told that sometimes they would be in a mixed formation and on takeoff, if you do formation takeoff, the, the stress was very significant, so you had to be very careful because if you had a small mouth or the big mouth, the, the big mouth would not you overtake the the small mouth, you know, mm -hmm. even though they had the same engine. So, um, but that didn't last too long. Eventually, all the GE engines were big mouth aircraft. The ones at Kunsan all were, so mm -hmm. you know there was no no problem there. And yes, the thrust was very significantly uh, increased, and. Uh, yeah, it was very enjoyable. And of course, in DACT, it made it even more capable. Um, then the aircraft was a little heavier too, so you know, offset a little bit of the mm -hmm. of the extra thrust, but not that much. I mean, uh, so um, the uh, the aircraft was very capable. Uh, but other than that, from a systems point of view, of course, the big the other big difference when I showed up at Kunsan is by then, uh, and you know, at Luke when we in training. But by then we had we were fully integrated with AMRAM, so that was a, a learning curve. You know how to learn how to use and employ you know long-range BVR uh, missiles and mm -hmm. fight that way because that's something that when I was at Han we didn't do. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, by the time at the end uh, when I was at Han we did have the software uh, on the aircraft to shoot the AMRAM, but we didn't have the missiles. So right, yeah. Usually people would play around with the so you know software and you know, but technically we, we're not you know. Like when we would do the SCT, we would not employ them because uh, there was there was not uh, something that we had anyway. But at Kunsan, it was a different story. Mm -hmm. It's like we sometimes pulled a air defense alert, and the aircraft were loaded with four AMRAMs and two AM9s. You know, so um, so uh, there was uh, it was very interesting, uh, di different. Say so we had there was a pretty good learning curve to learn how to employ it in that mode, BVR. So overall, did you enjoy your U.S. Air Force career flying the F-111 and the F-16? Oh yes, it was fantastic. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't change it for anything. Um, both aircraft were were very 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 uh, good jets. So the F-111, the only say, frustration, you know, I wanted to do some air-to-air. -air, so obviously in the F-16, I got to do that. Maybe not quite as much as I would like. I'll tell you the other thing. This I, I think I mentioned my. Sort of frustration that the the gun was installed in the F and eleven A anyway, not the F but the A, but we never got to shoot it. Well, I, I got to shoot the same gun, you know, the M sixty one Gatling gun in the F sixteen uh, a lot, including the first time I went to FTU at Luke, I actually shot the dart, and the interesting thing is the dart was towed by an F eighty six. Oh really? Wow. It was a contract, you know, it was a civilian contractor uh, that the Air Force had hired. And they were uh, they were uh, towed by an F-86, and a good thing that I was number four in the flight on that flight because I mm. shot the dart off the, the, the I cut the cable when I oh, shot. No. <laughs> um, so the the, the F-86 pilot thanked me later because he said he was kind of getting low on fuel and without the extra drag of the dart he he was easily able to recover. But uh, um, the uh, the, the uh, the the F eighty six pilot say say okay well good thing but it was good. again it was good that I was number I was the last guy in the four ship to shoot everybody else got to shoot first and then you know it was pure luck I mean or bad luck if you wanted to look at it that way I I was accurate but I actually cut the cable so it oh, was okay. interesting but that that's something they don't do anymore they 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 stop doing the dart uh, you know that like they'll do it at WISIP you know at uh, mm. the weapons uh, testing they'll they'll do it but. In in uh, in the training the formal training uh, squadron, they don't do that anymore. But you still get to shoot the gun in strafing air to ground a lot. So that's something that uh, I quite enjoyed um, because again, you know, in F one eleven, the gun was right in the aircraft there, and you couldn't shoot it. So it's... <laughs> We're going to wrap up this interview. We've got a, a question from one of our patrons and a few personal ones for me, if you're happy to answer them, Carl. Yes, absolutely. Right, so this is from Alexander. How big was the difference between the F-111 versions? Well, quite a bit in some ways. Now, I, I never flew the, the E model and the D model. No, so, but uh, 
the email was essentially the same as an email. Uh, there was there's some minor differences, like the air intakes were different, but from the avionics point of view, the engines were very similar, slightly different, but not that much. So there wasn't much different. Now, the emails were at Upper Hayford, RAF Upper Hayford in the UK. Uh, the D models were at Cannon Air Force Base in uh, New Mexico. The D model was very significant. It was very different. Now, again, I never flew it. I've sat in one, but I've never flown it. It, it had fully digital avionics. Uh, it's the only one that had a proper heads-up display, as opposed to a. No, we all had a, a, a bombing sight, um, but it didn't really have like full heads-up display functions. You know, but the, the D model did, uh, and it, and it's the only one that had one for both the. Had it and the wizard, so I had it on both sides, and it had digital avionics, which were much more advanced than the A and E model. Uh, the downside was the reliability wasn't so great, so because these were like early versions of you know, dig digital avionics, and um, the F model was kind of a hybrid, so it had partially analog, partially digital avionics. It had the big engines, as I mentioned it, so that was a very significant difference, uh, much more thrust than any other version. And it had the pave tack, which also I talked about the you know, laser designation, night infrared vision, uh, so you could attack in you know at night and and designate your own laser guided bombs. Um, so these were the main differences. Uh, you know, of course, then there is the FB one eleven in a strategic air command, which in, in eventually the tactical side inherited and renamed it the F one eleven G. And one of the differences with that one is just like the Australian F-111C, it had the longer wings, the, the, the bigger wings. And it also had, uh, you know, and, and they did upgrade uh, some of the E models, the G model with some mo more modern avionics uh, in the late 80s or early 90s. Um, um, but uh, yeah, it was like each each model had its own peculiarities, I, I suppose, you know, but transitioning from one to the other wasn't, it wasn't really hard. I mean, you know, they, they were there, you know, they had their peculiarities, but uh, mostly learning the new avionics, the, ma the maneuvering of the aircraft were very similar from one model to the other. Uh, the flight control systems were all the same. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Uh, yeah, I hope as that far as armaments, you know, armament and all that, laser guided bombs, uh, mostly on the F model because we could designate our own. The other ones technically could carry them, but then they would have to have somebody else designate for them, either a ground controller designating, or sometimes what we did, we'd have Navy A6s, A6E, that had the tram system that could designate for us. So it was like a buddy lasing system. But the F model could do it all by themselves. So. Brilliant. So, Carl, do you have any hobbies? Well, my main hobby these days is, uh, well, say I collect uh, aircraft models, you can see in the back, but uh, I do a lot of triathlon, so that uh, takes uh, quite a bit of my time, and marathon running. Uh, so I um, just recently did the Escape from Alcatraz triathlon in San Francisco, just uh, what, about three weeks ago, something like that. And, uh, and I read a lot about, I read a lot, uh, not exclusively, but a lot about military history, aviation history, uh, a lot of interest. Uh, you know, not, not all fighter pilots have that passion, but I do. I, I know a lot about like World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War. Uh, this, uh, it's, it's just a passion for me, you know, to learn about all these, these missions and, and great pilots and their accomplishments and, uh, and the history of air warfare. So it gives you a very, you know, wide perspective on, on how we got to the, to where we are and, uh, you know, why, uh, you know, aircraft are designed the way they are, and you know what's important in air to air in 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 in, in air warfare. You know, mm -hmm. some people, for example, tend to have the mistaken impression that it's all about duck fighting, and it's really not. You know, duck fighting is great. Don't get me wrong, but there's is way particularly you know in the air to air, there's way more to it than that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Do you, uh, favorite aircraft you have flown? Well, it's going to have to be the F-16, you know, so, <laughs> I mean, I love the F-111, but overall, overall, the F-16 is just, uh, yeah, to me, I think it'll remain as a classic aircraft. Of course, you know, there are many, many produce was, has been used and it is in use by many, many different countries. Uh, you know, first fly-by-wire aircraft, uh, the recline seat, the, the maneuverability, the bubble canopy, I mean, it's just, it's just an amazing aircraft. Yeah. And yes, now, 
you know, it's got serious competitors, you know, Eurofighter, uh, of course, the F-22 is just in a league of its own. That's no, oh, yeah, you no, know, it's uh, it's just an amazing aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the time, and even to still today, with the upgrades in avionics, you know, put a uh, electronically scanned radars in the F-16 and, uh, you know, some, some new avionics, uh, it's very, very capable to this day. In fact, some countries still bang it, so. One aircraft you would like to fly? Well, for me, it's, it's, it's I would say it's between the F-22 and F-35. I would say the F-22 has a somewhat of an edge. It's, uh, uh but, uh, because it, it's, it is an amazing aircraft, uh, I've seen it fly at air shows and uh, here in, in Orlando and I've also seen the F-35 fly and F-35 would have the edge as far as avionics um, yeah. because I think it would be kind of and I have flown the F-35 simulator not not the fully classified you know simulator but I've flown a, a, like a unclassified versions mm -hmm. at the trade shows uh, and I've, I've, I've worn the, the, the helmet you know and uh, just just the thought of being able to see through your helmets, through the, through your own air. It's crazy. It's just to me. It's just crazy. But so that would be kind of cool. But from a pure, you know, aerodynamic performance, uh, the F twenty two is just it's just incredible. And of course, uh, you know, it's just a fantastic. So I would say the F twenty two, and second close second, the F thirty five. I think what you're doing is fantastic. Uh, really. Uh, Hope you know. I wish you all all the success. I think I've watched a lot. I wouldn't say I watched all your videos, but I've watched quite a lot. So oh, I appreciate. That. I think it's great. It's great to hear from pilots of various nations and backgrounds, and pilots and you know air crew in general. I mean, wizards and engineers and, and whatnot. I think you're doing a you know a needed fulfilling a, a need that and people really enjoy it, and I, I as well. I really enjoy it. Well, I appreciate the kind words. And Carl, thank you very much for coming on the show. I'm sure our viewers have really enjoyed this interview. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, you're welcome.